Dr. Teresa Sievers found dead Monday in her Bonita Springs home on Jarvis Road. And tonight we're learning breaking new details in this case. NBC2 broke this story last night as we were live on the scene at 6 o'clock. Investigators were searching the home and collecting evidence. Now we know the victim, Teresa Sievers, was a wife and mother of two. She ran a hormone therapy and holistic healing practice out of a sterile. Heather, the scene out here does still remain very active, as you said. Several deputy cars, crime scene vans are still here. Four days after this investigation started, the Lee County Sheriff's Office confirms that they're following several leads in this case as part of the investigation. It's been a week since Dr. Sievers was found murdered in her Bonita Springs home. No one has been arrested. Detectives were back at the house today. According to neighbors, investigators told them the murder weapon was a hammer. We saw deputies take away a heavily fingerprinted door and the family's van as evidence. New at 6, NBC2 anchor Joe Rhodes has learned Seavers is not the only Florida doctor with ties to holistic medicine found dead in recent weeks. A local tragedy unfolding in Bonita Springs getting national attention. Bob Shell tonight, we go live to Bonita Springs, Florida. In the last hours, mystery surrounding the murder of a gorgeous young doctor. Dr. Teresa Seaver's brutal killing is captivating. Some people are connecting it online to the deaths of two other doctors with ties to Florida. Each of these three doctors and their deaths are stories that are not finished being told yet, despite what official accounts may say. One of two Missouri men charged in the murder of Dr. Teresa Sievers is reportedly an active person of interest in the disappearance of a Missouri minister whose body has never been found. A published report from 1996 says 47-year-old Curtis Wayne Wright has been a person of interest in this disappearance of 33-year-old Ronnie Bolin since this case began. The last time anyone heard from Bolin was on July 8, 1996. His car was found the next day at a car wash in St. Louis. Bolin had reportedly been a pre for several years. Well, last week, Governor Rick Scott signed a request to have uh, Curtis Wainwright brought back to Lee County to face charges. A bond hearing is slated for tomorrow. Wright's alleged accomplice, Jimmy Rogers, remains in a Missouri jail on a probation violation. Meanwhile, family members say Wright is the best friend of Dr. Teresa Seaver's husband, Mark, who has not been charged in this case. Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is a bi-weekly podcast covering true crime. Unsolved mysteries. Missing people. Urban legends and the dark side of the Sunshine State. So first, if you would like to support the show, please subscribe to us at patreon.com backslash Paradise After Dark podcast. On Patreon, you'll have access to weekly bonus episodes, our monthly spinoff show, Vacation Edition, discounts on our merchandise, and more. You can also check out our website, paradiseafterdark.com, for our latest episodes, links to social media, our Etsy store, and a special little donate button if you just want to help out the show. If you have a question, a Florida case suggestion, or you'd just like to chat, please email us at paradiseafterdarkpodcast at gmail.com. So, Lauren, fill us in here. So, we are getting into part two of the murder of Dr. Teresa Seavers in Bonita Springs, Florida. This is, this is a brutal murder, not just a murder. A brutal murder. So let's recap real quick. First of all, if you haven't listened to part one, go back and do that. So let's recap real yeah, quick. None though. of this will make sense if you don't. Dr. Teresa Sievers, a well-known and loved holistic doctor, was murdered in her home in Bonita Springs, Florida on June 28, 2015. She and her family had been out of town in Connecticut that weekend, but Dr. Sievers returned early before her husband, Mark, and their two daughters. She did not show up for work the following day, and a family friend went by to check on her, finding her dead in her home. She had been bludgeoned to death with a hammer. Now, at the end of our last episode, we told you that in a press conference that August, 
Lee County Sheriff's Office announced that they had arrested two men in connection with the murder, Curtis Wayne Wright Jr. and Jimmy Ray Rogers, both of Missouri. Yeah. Now, at, at one thing I got to tell you, at this point, when that happened and, and before anything else that we're going to discuss comes out, I was just so grateful that her children were not there. Not that what happened was a, any better, but had the children been there, could they have been victims too? Right, yeah. Because I know that that was one of the things that people discussed when this first happened. Like, oh my God, I'm so glad her, you know, she didn't bring home her children. Right. Because that could have been even worse. Okay, so now apparently working behind the scenes, police already had a theory and suspects in mind. And within two weeks of Teresa's death, Sheriff Scott said the two lead detectives on the case traveled all the way to Missouri. Now, although they had only planned to stay for a few days, they ended up staying for three entire weeks. They say a tip led them to a double-wide trailer 1,100 miles away in the Missouri Ozarks, and then to Curtis Wayne Wright. Now, outside the trailer, a white Hyundai rental car leads to the first clue that split the investigation wide open. And we'll get into all those details a little later. Now, Wright rented the vehicle June 24th and returned it six days later with an additional 2,700 miles on the odometer, according to investigative documents. The car was recovered in Phoenix and processed for evidence on July 14th. Now, inside the car, a GPS device reveals a bombshell. Teresa's home address had been typed in from Benita Springs. And even more, the GPS is registered to an email address with an even different man's name, Jimmy Rogers. So let's take a closer look at these two men. Jimmy Ray Rogers grew up with one older brother in Paris, Missouri, a small town about two and a half hours northwest of St. Louis. His mother died in the year 2000 when he was nine years old. His father died seven years later, and he was described as a troubled child. He was always messing with guns and knives and playing army, and he was a little devil, you know, but ever since he was a small kid, he'd had guns and was obsessed with them, neighbor Jimmy Ball told the Naples Daily News. Five years before his arrest in the death of Dr. Teresa Sievers in Benita Springs, Jimmy Rogers was in the throes of another criminal case. In the summer of 2010, Rogers was out on bond in Missouri, waiting to stand trial on federal, on a federal charge of possession of a firearm by a felon. Federal prosecutors called him a danger to the community and insisted he be arrested before the trial. And on August 20th, 2010, Rogers was booked into the St. Genevieve County Jail. So five years before this, he was arrested for possession of a firearm by a felon? Yes. So he was obviously already a felon for trouble he'd been in. Yes. Now, Curtis Wainwright Jr. grew up in Hillsboro, Missouri, about 45 minutes south of St. Louis. Wright was well-liked in the school and voted senior class president. In the senior superlatives, his classmates dubbed him the most dependable. I think of a lot of I think if a lot of people are honest or truthful just knowing him or meeting him, you would probably like him, childhood friend Greg Boland told Naples Daily News. Wright was the life of the party, someone who was a lot of fun to be around. He was an expert at scheming to get girls. That's why we was a lot of fun to hang out with, Boland said. His other good buddy throughout high school and long afterward, Mark Sievers. After high school, Wright's girlfriend became pregnant, something he was not prepared for, according to Bolin. At one point during the pregnancy, Bolin said Wright tried to get him to run his girlfriend off the road to mess with her. Bolin obviously said he refused. Now, Wright grew close to Greg Bolin's older brother, Ronnie Bolin. Unbeknownst to Greg Bolin, his older brother started using meth with Wright. Shit. Unbeknownst to Greg Bolin, his older brother actually started using meth with Wright following a divorce from his wife. Now, in July of 1996, Ronnie Bolin's car was found abandoned at a car wash in St. Louis with the driver's door open and the keys still inside. Now, almost immediately, detectives began looking for Curtis Wright, who was and still is considered to be a person of interest in Bolin's disappearance. A missing persons report says Wright owed somewhere between $900 and $1,500 to Ronnie Bolin, who had been threatening to, quote, spill the beans about something Wright was involved in. Now, Ronnie Bolin's body was never found, and in 2010, Wright was arrested after authorities found a meth lab in his home, and he was held at the St. Genevieve County Jail. Now, about this Ronnie Bolin. So, he was hanging out with Ronnie Bolin, mm -hmm. doing meth, and they found the car, and he was supposed to be with him that day, 
and he comes up missing. So he was basically the last person to see him. Yes. And that he's disappeared. And it's that case is not solved to this day. Curtis Wayne Wright supposedly owed Ronnie Bolin money, and Ronnie Bolin was threatening to spill the beans about something. Yeah. Some kind of criminal activity that Wright was involved in. And probably the meth lab. Probably. So they found the meth lab and he went to the St. Genevieve County Jail, which I mentioned earlier is where Jimmy Rogers was being held. The hammer. Jimmy the hammer. We'll get to that. Self nickname. Major Jason Schott of the St. Genevieve County confirmed that Rogers and Wright were in the same pod of the jail in the 2010 to 2011 time frame. This is where the two became friends. Wright even asked his wife at the time to write to Rogers, saying he was a good kid and his charges were bogus. Now, his wife never wrote letters to Rogers. So why would Wright and Rogers drive some 1,100 miles from Missouri to Florida to allegedly bludgeon Teresa Seavers to death? The sheriff says they were hitman in a Devious murder for hire orchestrated by Teresa's very own husband, Mark. And as everything unfolds, with the evidence that they had, that's the only thing that could really go well, with. Now, remember that Curtis Wayne Wright was Mark Seaver's best friend, and he's the one that Teresa Seavers supposedly fantasized about. Yeah. So uh, there, there's some other speculation as to how that case goes. Well, maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit. So Taylor Shoemaker... Jimmy Rogers' girlfriend told investigators that Mark Seavers had hired Wright, who then hired Rogers to carry out the killing for money. On the Friday before Dr. Teresa Seavers was killed, Jimmy Rogers punched out at 6 p.m. from his job at a construction company in eastern Missouri. He told his girlfriend he'd be out of state on a business trip that ex- he expected to net him $10,000. His employer, JV Contracting, says Rogers wasn't scheduled to work on June 27th, 28th, or 29th, contradicting his story. Sometime after leaving work that Friday, Rogers traveled more than 1,100 miles south, where his probation officer said he was spotted at a Walmart store in Fort Myers, Florida, on Sunday, June 28th. So he's already in trouble for leaving Leaving, on probation. Leaving the state while on probation, yeah. Yeah, he can't fight that. Now, when Jimmy Rogers returned home, he reportedly told Shoemaker about the killing and pointed her to where they'd hid the evidence. Now, evidently, quite a bit of evidence. He brought it all here and threw it away and told Taylor where it was. I think they found the bloody jumpsuit he wore, said Kathy Gaston, a family member. While investigators were piecing the puzzle together in Florida, Rogers' neighbor said he was bragging about the crime in Missouri. Rogers, who reportedly goes by the nickname, as we spoke about earlier, Hammer, told people in his hometown that he was a hitman. He always talks about how his favorite weapon was a hammer. He said it to me multiple times. My favorite weapon was a hammer, said Roger's neighbor. So this is a self-proclaimed... Hitman. Yeah, hammer hitman. Whose favorite weapon is a hammer, and Teresa Seavers was killed with a a hammer. Sounds like a childhood fantasy, wanting to name yourself the hammer. It's like trying to be a tough guy. So like I mentioned a minute ago, Rogers was caught at a Walmart on Six Mile Cypress Parkway in Fort Myers, Florida, the night before Teresa's murder, setting his arrest in motion. His girlfriend then told investigators everything when they moved in for the arrest. She started to become suspicious of her boyfriend not long after he returned from Florida. There was a frantic phone call from Curtis Wainwright Jr. to Jimmy Rogers about a warrant served to search his home. Then there was the questioning of Rogers by investigators. Then Rogers destroyed his phone in a water fountain and tossed items he brought back from Florida in garbage bags and disposed of them along a Missouri highway. Shoemaker finally confronted Rogers as they lay in bed one night. She said she knew he had gone to Florida on June 27th, despite what he told detectives. Rogers admitted he went to make money. She then bluffed and said that she knew he went to kill someone. Rogers confirmed her comment. Shoemaker asked who, and Rogers said Mark Seavers had hired Wright to drive to Florida and kill his wife for insurance money. What Mark didn't know was Wright offered Rogers $10,000 to help. 
So Mark Seavers apparently didn't know that Curtis Wayne Wright had pulled in his friend Jimmy Rogers to help with this. Yeah, because apparently he wasn't, he didn't feel like he was going to have the balls to get it done. So he brought so, in the hammer. Shoemaker asked how they killed her, and she guessed that she was shot. But Rogers laughed and said that they had killed her with a hammer. We have part of her statement here. Can we plan it now? And Corporal Jenkins, can you just have her uh, basically put her under oath, have her mm-hmm. swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth throughout the course of our state? All right. Do you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes. Throughout the entirety of your statement? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corporal. I appreciate mm-hmm. it. All right, now that that's out of the way, um, obviously, you remember when I came to speak to you a couple weeks ago, right? Yes. Sergeant Webb and myself came to your house, and we came to speak to you, and and you remember what it was regarding? Yeah. What was it regarding? Wayne murdering Mark's wife. Okay. And when we spoke to Jenny, and in your presence, he told us that he had never been in Florida, had never gone to Florida, and had no contact with Wayne. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. But now, uh, we came to your house earlier today, and uh, we had a search warrant for your house, and in speaking with you, you told me that uh, Jimmy Ray Rogers, who is your your boyfriend, boyfriend um, actually did go to Florida with Wayne for the purpose of committing a murder yeah. for uh, a sum of money, correct? Yes. And how much money was he supposed to get for this? Close to 10000 Okay. Can you start from the beginning and let me know everything that happened and about how you learned about what happened and everything you did leading up to us talking today? Um, well, it was kind of pieced together over time. No, I know. Just take your time. And just you just randomly of... told me stuff. Okay. It wasn't like a big, long conversation. I was just like, um, like after you guys came, I asked him if he went to Florida and he told me yeah. And then... I asked him what he went down there for, and he said to make money. And then asked him how does he make money, and it was murdering Mark's wife. Okay. Who is Teresa Sievers? Yeah. The doctor? Yes. Okay. And did he say how he murdered her? With a hammer. And why do you think he would use a hammer? Is that his weapon of choice? Or yes. From what you were telling me, do they, they call him the hammer? He calls himself the hammer, or what's... Everybody calls him Jimmy the Hammer. All of his friends back home. And, and you had indicated to me that's because that's his weapon of choice whenever he has to do something? Yes. Okay. I just want to go to the beginning. Now, that we're talking about, remember when we came to talk to you, um, we believed at that time that uh, that Wayne and possibly Jimmy had left for Florida on June 27, 2015 and got back around June 29, 2015. So it would be a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Yeah. Now at that time... He uh, was only gone for a few days. Yeah, so three or four days, right? Mm-hmm. Um, on the 27th, which would have been a Friday, if I remember correctly... Yes, um, it was a Friday. It was a Friday, when right? When he left. Um, Wayne came to the house to pick him up, right? Yes, in a white car. In a white car? Um, was it was it, a rental. A rental? Was it like a, a Hyundai or anything like that? Do you remember what kind of I, I don't know what kind it was. It just it was an air car and it was a rental. And it was earlier in the morning? Yes, it was real early in the morning. Around what time? I know you're not going to remember the exact time. About 7.38. Oh, about 7.38. Oh, so you do remember the exact time. That's impressive. Yeah, because I don't do mornings. <laughs> yeah, we're going to say Do you um Do you remember why he was leaving, why he told you he was leaving? He didn't tell me why he was He just said he was leaving for a couple days? He said he was going to work at that time. I didn't know that he was going to Florida at that time. Did he have any bags packed with him or anything that you saw? Did he bring anything with him? Um, I didn't see him leave with anything, so maybe he had it already all packed in the car. Okay. Because whenever he came back, he had all the stuff that I informed you guys about. So what day do you think he gets home? Uh, it was Monday whenever I came. So that would have been Monday, yeah. June 30th? Yeah. Do you remember around what time? No, that's just what time he got home, well, to my mom's to pick me up. Was it like the, the like the afternoon or evening when he came to your mom's? I really don't remember. Okay. And your mom's in Belterra, right? Yeah. Okay. Or Bonterra, I'm sorry. I keep saying yeah, Bonterra. 
So now when he picks you up, uh, do you remember what he's wearing? Do you wear anything in addition? Anything? I don't remember. Can't remember? Okay. What did he tell you about working or anything? Oh, about? I do remember what he was wearing. Okay. It was uh, that red Budweiser shirt. The red Budweiser shirt? Okay. The one that you showed me in the closet today? Yes. Okay. And had he owned that shirt before he went away? No. Okay. So he brought it back with him. So now he picks you up at your mom's house, which we assume is going to be in the evening on Monday, the 30th. I'm pretty sure it was the evening. Okay. Um, do you go back to your house, or where do you go? Yeah, we went back to my house. What did he pick you up at? Do you remember? His car. Oh, his um, black Kia? Yeah. Okay. So he picks you and the kids up, and you go back home? Mm-hmm. Did he unload anything out of the car? No. Nothing? Mm-mm. Okay. It was already inside in the kitchen. It was inside in the kitchen? Okay, when you say it, what, what do you mean? A uh, white cooler and a black backpack. And okay. And stuff in it. Okay, so the white cooler, and just, just so I got this straight, the white cooler that was in there was the white cooler that you showed me in the back of the van today at your house, yes. right? Okay. And what was in the white cooler? Um, a box of gloves, a hammer, something else. I can't remember right now. Just take your time with things. There's nothing, no rush. I know you're tired. Okay, can you describe the gloves for me? They came up about three inches past your wrist. So to about here? Um, yeah, about right here. Okay. And what color were they? They were dark blue. Dark blue? And were they like latex or? Yes, they were latex. So they were blue latex gloves that came three inches past the rest about? Yeah, they were just a little bit thicker than a doctor's glove. Were they in a box or anything like that? Yeah, they were in a glove box, in like an actual glove box. Cardboard glove yeah, box? Yeah. Okay. And uh, were there any used gloves in there that you saw? No. Um, no. Right, so you said you saw the a The jumpsuit that he had in the black backpack was rolled up. Okay, we'll get to that one second. I just want to make sure that we have everything in the cooler. So there's gloves in the cooler mm-hmm. and a hammer, you said, right? Yeah. And what did the hammer look like? It was a ball peen hammer, had a black handle. So it was a ball peen hammer with a black handle. Yeah. And was anything else in the cooler that you could think of? I'm thinking the shoes was. Yeah, you mentioned something about black shoes, right? Yeah, they're dress shoes. Dress shoes? Yeah, kind of like dress shoes. You mentioned, you said like something a, like a... Like a boot and a dress shoe. I, mean, I don't know how to explain it, but... Okay, what color were they? They were black. So they had like the sole of a boot? Yeah. But they looked like dress shoes on on the top? Yeah. Okay. Um, did you see anything on them or anything like that? No. Were they in a bag or anything or just sitting in the cooler? They were just in the cooler. Okay. So in the cooler, there was gloves, a hammer, and shoes. And shoes, that's it. Okay. And then he also had a black backpack. Yeah. Had you ever seen that black backpack before, or did you yes, bring that it's back? Mine. Oh, that's your backpack? Yeah. Okay. And what was in that backpack? Uh, the only thing that I seen him pull out was the rolled up jumpsuit, dark blue jumpsuit. And that's the jumpsuit that you took, that you showed me that you yeah, had to throw out the window? Yeah, that the window. Did you see anything on the jumpsuit, or was it just rolled no, up? No, it was just rolled up, I didn't see anything. Did you see anything else in the black bag? No, I didn't see anything else. Okay. Because he took it off into the bedroom. And can you think of anything else that you had with him? Mm-hmm. Had you ever seen those overalls before? Did they belong in before that, or did he yeah. buy them? Oh, so he owned them before? Mm-hmm. Okay. He got them from uh, one of the places that he worked for Tyler Juliet. Oh, okay. So now, as time goes on, they're now, all in fireproof. Fireproof. Yeah. Okay. As time goes on, now, do you ever? Did you ever talk about his trip again after that before I came to talk to you? Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell me what you talked about? I don't remember when it was, but we were laying in bed at my mom's. And uh, I told him that I knew. I didn't actually know. Mm -hmm. It was after you guys came. And I told him that I knew that he had something to do with it. Okay. And then he and then he started asking me questions like what I know about and I'm like, Well, I know you went down there to kill somebody And then he said, Yeah And then um I I took a guess at Mark's wife and then he said yeah And, and you said when you said Mark's wife you're talking about Teresa Sievers? 
The doctor that was killed? Yes. Okay. And then um, I said, did you shoot her? And he said, no. And I said, then how how did you kill her? And he made a stupid little chuckle that he does and then said, with a hammer. You said with a hammer? Yeah. Okay. And what else did he tell you about that? That's it. You guys didn't have any other conversation about it? Mm-hmm. Okay. I got scared after that. And I, see, I could definitely understand that. that. Um, so basically from the time that he got home from Florida to the time that I talked to you, you didn't know really why he went down there. Mm-hmm. But then when um, Sergeant Levitt and myself came to talk to you that day and told you why we were there, mm-hmm. did you kind of figure that's why he was down there? Or? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then I, I pretty much told him that I knew that was the reason I, that he admitted it to me. Okay. So Shoemaker's statement is part of a 33-page probable cause affidavit outlining why Wright and Rogers were charged with the killing of Dr. Teresa Sievers on Sunday, June 28th. Mark Sievers was taken into custody on February 26, 2016 on a second-degree murder charge for the killing of his wife, Dr. Teresa Sievers. Now, Sheriff Scott made a statement about Mark's arrest. As I said early on, we would not leave any stones unturned. Our people worked tirelessly on this case. I've maintained all along that uh, it was an active, ongoing investigation. I think everybody has sensed, both in the media and in our community, that this was very much active and very much ongoing. But I don't think you realize, nor does our community realize, the extent of investigation and effort that went into this case. Uh, Many of the gentlemen that are flanking me right now, particularly our major crimes unit, our crime analysts, our digital forensics people, our um, evidence technicians. Absolutely unbelievable work, and I'm so proud of this agency. Perhaps in my 12 years as sheriff, I don't know that I can recall a prouder moment. In terms of the body of work that was completed here, as you've seen, Mark Sievers is going to jail right now. He's being charged with second-degree murder. Those charges may change. That's up to the state attorney's office. Of course, we want to be respectful of the prosecution phase of this, who has also done a great job with us toward the latter part of this investigation, and will continue on from here. But uh, it's a very serious case that gripped our community. Our community can take solace in knowing that the power of the sheriff's office was brought to bear on three very dangerous people who gave a great deal, and I want to underscore, a great deal of effort and and energy into covering the tracks, into throwing us off on on the track in that term. And so it's um, it's something, again, that I'm very proud of, and our community can rest easy knowing that there's closure here in this case. I do anticipate that this brings closure to the case. I'm not... uh, uh, indicating that there's anything really further to do at this point. We were after Mark Seavers. Uh, we got our man, and, and we're very happy for that. Okay, so when confronted with the evidence, Curtis Wayne Wright ultimately confesses. Now, Wright pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 25 years in prison with the stipulation that he would testify against Jimmy Rogers and Mark Seavers. Curtis Wright must provide substantial assistance to the state attorney's office as part of the plea deal, said Samantha Sion spokeswoman for the state attorney's office. Now, Jimmy Rogers pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder. He waived his right to a speedy trial because his lawyers needed time to sift through the five, I'm sorry, 50,000 pages of oh. documents. Now, Mark Sievers was ultimately charged and pled not guilty to first-degree murder, upgraded from second-degree murder. Prosecutors announced that they would be seeking the death penalty against Mark. Now, he was held on a $4.43 million bond in Lee County Jail. And that's the same amount he stood to gain from the insurance policies after Teresa's death. Irony? Yeah. I think so. Now, here's here's something that, and I know we probably covered it, and I'm sure our listeners know this, but let's just cover it again. He's He was, we can guarantee you, we already know that he was 100% in Connecticut when all this occurred. Right. Now, he's being charged with first-degree murder. Now, you would think that someone being charged with first-degree murder because they were there to do this deed, right? Like right. Someone who you physically were there, you had the hammer, you created this heinous act, and therefore you're being charged with first-degree murder. Someone who's an accessory might be get charged with something less, which I think is why they originally came in with the um, second-degree murder charge. Right. If he wasn't there and he wasn't involved, why is he being charged for murder? Maybe you clarify that for me. I mean, I know, but maybe you clarify it for listeners. Well, he planned the whole thing. Okay. And you know, I'm not a, I I I'm not the prosecutor, 
So I'm not 100% sure at this point why they they upgraded from second degree murder to first degree murder. Maybe we'll find out in part three and four of this episode. Um, but is it is it one of those things where if if you if someone is killed in the act of a crime and you were involved in that crime somehow that you are an ex, you that's are part of that felony crime? murder? Okay, that's what that's what's called felony murder. Yes, if you are involved in a crime like say a robbery and your partner shoots and kills somebody, even though you didn't do the killing, you are still charged with murder, felony murder, because it was it happened during the commission of a felony. Okay, and that is different. See, and that's what I was trying to get to. That is somewhat different than this particular case. Yes. Okay. That's what I, I was trying to lead into that. I to believe try to- what, what my thoughts are is that they charged Mark Seavers with first-degree murder because he was the one who planned it. He was the one who offered his friend money to kill his wife like he was the main guy running this whole show so although he wasn't the one that was swinging the hammer he He ultimately orchestrated the whole thing he ultimately put the whole ball into motion right okay and that's what i was trying to get to i just want to kind of clarify that before we you know close down because it's gonna be another week before we get to the next part and i don't want the people because it originally i was like why why would they be charging him like that because but then i guess it makes total sense because without him None of this approaching would have anybody happened. exactly, so it's ultimately his fault that all of this occurred. Right. So, so are we are we going to go ahead and finish off right here? Yeah, this is going to be it for part two. If you don't want to wait a week for part three and four, go ahead and head on over to our Patreon, subscribe, and you can binge all four episodes at one time. Yeah. So I guess that's going to be it for tonight. Yep. Check out our Etsy store for some awesome Paradise After Dark gear, and please make sure to follow us on social media at Paradise After Dark Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, and at Paradise Dark 239 on Twitter. You can also email us at Paradise After Dark Podcast at gmail.com. Yeah, do that. We, Lauren is very good about uh, responding to people in uh, communicating. So you can also check out our website, ParadiseAfterDark.com, for our latest episodes, links to the social media Lauren just spoke about, our Etsy store, and, of course, Patreon. And make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening on and rate and review. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. Exactly. It really does help. So thanks for listening to Paradise After Dark. Dark, dark.